Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, January 23rd. I feel disappointed. He let down his community. This is um, the tip of the iceberg. Some are nervous, others say they feel betrayed. City Council reacts to the stunning report that longtime Alderman Danny Solis secretly recorded Alderman Ed Burke as part of a federal corruption investigation. And two former federal prosecutors assess this latest development. This is a wake-up call to everybody. How does today's development impact the race for mayor? Our Spotlight political reporting team weighs in on that and other top issues of the week. And a mayoral forum on the southwest side is just a warm-up for an aldermanic forum at the same location. Starting moments from now, which will include Ed Burke, we get a live preview. We're going to provide financial empowerment and financial dignity to the residents of Chicago. The city treasurer teams up with the national nonprofit to expand financial, financial empowerment centers in Chicago neighborhoods. The waves are pretty big today. Not really that clean, but still getting some fun rides out of the waves. Surfers brave the cold weather to ride some waves on Lake Michigan in northwest Indiana. And if winter surfing's a little too cool for you, we have more cool stuff for you to do in Chicago when it is cold out. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A new report on sexual abuse at Chicago public schools. Eddie Ruza has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Eddie. Phil, four substitute teachers and six other CPS employees have been fired and ordered not to go on school grounds following sexual misconduct investigations by the Chicago Public Schools Inspector General Nicholas Schuler. In a report to the board, Schuler says 33 other CPS workers ranging from teachers to security guards and even bus workers have been removed from their jobs as allegations are investigated. Schuler says 169 reports were filed against CPS employees from September to December of 2018. CPS officials also say a separate investigatory team is looking into student-on-student -student sexual assault allegations. A lawsuit that began more than a half century ago was officially settled today. 
A U.S. district judge approved an agreement between public housing activists and the Chicago Housing Authority to continue building what's called scattered site housing throughout the city. There's also an agreement to improve the system of housing vouchers and provide a timeline on more mixed income building construction. The lawsuit was originally brought in 1966 on behalf of community organizer Dorothy Gautreau, who called Chicago's public housing discriminatory. She said the system kept low-income black residents concentrated in high-rises, preventing them from, from the benefits of better neighborhoods. Today's settlement gives the CHA until July of 2024 to fully comply with the terms of the agreement. The future of Chicago food trucks is now up to the Illinois Supreme Court. The state's high court took up a lawsuit against the city of Chicago brought by a food truck owner who claims the city's restrictions, keeping trucks 200 feet away from a brick and mortar eatery and mandating trucks have GPS devices so they can be tracked, are unconstitutional. The city argues the law is a necessary protection for restaurants because of the tax revenue they generate as well as their contributions to tourism. So far, two lower courts have ruled against the truck owner. And a different kind of food truck arrived at O'Hare Airport today. The Salvation Army provided free lunches for TSA agents who re remain on the job while not getting paid. Today is the 33rd day of the federal government shutdown, and hundreds of thousands of government workers deemed essential are ordered to keep reporting to work. That includes 1,000 TSA agents at O'Hare and another 400 at Midway. This is a unique situation in that Typically when we respond to disaster, it's usually a flood where a home has been destroyed or a tornado or a hurricane. What's, what's been taken away is one's income. And in the weather forecast, get ready for what is likely to be the first of two Arctic blasts in the coming week. We will have mostly cloudy skies tonight with a low of 12 degrees, then partly cloudy and a high of 22 tomorrow before temperatures take a sharp dive below zero tomorrow night. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Eddie. Even before getting charged in a criminal complaint, Alderman Ed Burke was in for the fight of his political life. In a few minutes, we will talk about the latest in the Burke investigation, including a fellow alderman reportedly wearing a wire. But first, we go live to the southwest side in Chicago tonight's Amanda Vinicky, where Burke is about to face the other candidates vying for his aldermanic seat. Amanda. Phil, this will be the first public forum where Alderman Ed Burke will face his challengers, Jaime Guzman and Tanya Patino. I'm at the New Life Church in Archer Heights where Alderman Burke entered just a bit ago. Journalists did chase after him, trying to pepper him with questions about that wiretap, also about a story the Chicago Tribune broke today regarding a job that evidently Burke may have tried to get for his son through Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, asking Burke, for example, whether he had had a conversation with Preckwinkle and actually asked her to take on his son. Burke, again, ignored all of those questions. Now, despite Burke having lost his city paid for city funded detail following the criminal complaint in the loss of his chairman of the financial committee, Burke did appear to have a bodyguard of some sort or protection with him. That forum is just about to get underway. Now, as for these other challengers, both Guzman and Patino had filed to run against Burke even before the criminal complaint had gotten underway. Burke, of course, had won his first race in 1969 and has been a member of the Chicago City Council ever since. In that time, he amassed, of course, a whole lot of power. But Guzman says for any voters that think that it's a good idea to vote for Burke because he can bring something back with all that power and prestige, he says that no longer holds true. Here's Guzman. He's not the same alderman anymore. The argument that, well, you know, he brings resources because he's powerful, he has a lot of influence, well, he's no longer holding the purse. He's no longer the chairman of the finance committee, so that's no longer the case. And Patino says that all of that prestige and power that Burke had, well, 
that didn't show up and wasn't at all evident in the community. She says that's why she decided to run. Here she is. Frustration that our ward is not given the representation that they deserve, right? They deserve honesty and transparency, and that's something that the current incumbent is not doing. Patino is a civil engineer. Guzman is a lawyer. Now, of course, today the Chicago City Council, as you'll hear more in the show later, began to take up an ethics package that was very clearly aimed at fallout from Alderman Burke, including limitations on outside employment for members of the City Council. Guzman says that that's a policy that Hill has already agreed to adopt in practice. Here he is. No outside employment for myself, no outside employment for anybody that works for me. Uh, why? Because we have to stop that. It's important that we, we, we have an ethical use of taxpayer dollars, and at the same time, that if we're committed to really serve people, that we focus on that and nothing else. Now, Patino has the coveted endorsement from Congressman Chuy Garcia, something that Guzman had aimed for as well. There was additionally another candidate who dropped out and is now also backing Patino. Guzman, he says that it's as if there is a push to try and replace one form of cronyism under Burke with another one, that there should be nothing in the neighborhood to try and direct to have somebody in place. For example, Patino's older, or per, pardon me, Patino's boyfriend is newly elected state representative Aaron Ortiz, and that is again where Guzman alleges that Patino is has a, a push to try and get her into this Chicago City Council she, seat. Patino says that that is in fact not the case. That her yes. Ortiz is her boyfriend, but he does not have the power and that everyone had tried to get that, again, coveted endorsement from Mr. Garcia. There will be a couple of, oral, of other forums scheduled here in the 14th Ward coming up in mid-February. No word yet, though, however, on whether Burke or which of the candidates will be in attendance for those. You will be able to check the Chicago Tonight website later on for the latest on what happened at this forum that, again, is just about to get started. The first between Burke and his challengers in the 14th Ward. Phil, back to you. Thank you, Amanda. A mixture of surprise, anger, and disappointment from city council members today after the Sun-Times reported that longtime Alderman Danny Solis wore a wire to assist the federal investigation into Alderman Ed Burke. Paris Schutz has the latest. Paris. Phil, that report certainly sent shockwaves through a pre-scheduled city council meeting today. Solis, as you mentioned, is reported to have recorded at least 12 conversations with Burke over two years, assisting the federal corruption investigation into Burke. Solis himself has been a powerful, longtime alderman, former head of the Hispanic Democratic Organization, longtime chair of city council's zoning committee, so that means he has been at the heart of major decisions that affect all the big developments in the city of Chicago. Now, Alderman seem resigned that if Solis is doing this, it must mean that he's in hot water himself. And indeed, Carol Marine has reported that Solis has been under federal investigation since at least 2014. Now, today's city council meeting was also notable because it was Ed Burke's first since formally being charged with attempted extortion. Gone were the security guards. Gone was his perch at the center of the city council floor with his always buzzing with activity. Instead, Burke quietly took his new seat at the end of the first row, interacting with very few aldermen. And reporters did chase down Burke to get his reaction to this Solis news. Burke reiterated that he believes he has still done nothing wrong. And anything that uh, uh, Alderman Solis recorded, if he did, isn't going to make any difference. Are you going to stay in the race? Are you going to stay in the race? I'm uh, not only going to stay in the race, I'm going to win. Do you believe that Alderman, do you believe Alderman Solis did report to if he did, I don't know. Do you feel it's treason that he recorded it? Pardon me? Do you feel it's treason he recorded it? I don't have any knowledge of that. Paris, true that some aldermen feel betrayed by what Alderman Solis did? Some of them did, Phil. Aldermen like Carrie Austin, she shook her head saying, quote, you just don't do that, as if there's some unwritten code of silence among aldermen in a case like this. One alderman was asked if other colleagues, including himself, could be caught up in some of these Solis recordings. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. I mean, there's, you know, if you've done nothing wrong and you, and you, you grind it out, 
like a lot of us do, there's nothing to worry about. Are you, do you feel betrayed? You worked with Alderman Solis for many, many I, years. I feel disappointed that um, I would prefer that he exited. Look, I, I come from the military. I was honorably discharged. That was a proud moment uh, in, my, in my family. So that's what I'm about. I will leave here honorably discharged when I, when I, when I end my service, period. Meanwhile, other colleagues express sorrow at this whole situation. It tells me that a very serious investigation is going on, that we have, uh, we will have uh, more to see, more to see, and we need to wait and see how this develops. This is um, the tip of the iceberg. There's more to come. Um, I think everybody knows that as this uh, spreads out. Um, we're going to have to make sure that we push for the reforms that taxpayers have wanted for far too long. I'm disappointed that uh, he let down his community. Um, simple fact that something occurred in order to put him in that position, uh, compromised, uh, him being compromised and then letting down his community is, is, is disappointing. There's a lesson to be drawn. It's not what that alderman did or this alderman done. That our work of restoring the confidence people have in those who serve them and they elect is not done. And Paris, uh, Alderman Solis may have inadvertently foreshadowed today's news when he was on Chicago tonight just a couple of months ago. Remind us what that was about. Phil, he appeared here November 26th right after he had made the surprise decision not to run for re-election. And he made this decision, mind you, after he had turned in all his paperwork to run for re-election. So Carol asked him what he thought of Burke's re-election chances. Remember, this was before any raid on Burke had taken place. I think uh, Alderman Burke should reconsider. He should, maybe should get rid of the suits and have the open collar shirt too and no, you know, liberate. You, you've got money, you, you've got a great family, you, you've got grandkids. Why do you want to run? Today's news also comes ironically at, the, at a time when the city council was taking up ethics reform. What happened today on and that And this college? ethics reform, as Amanda mentioned, is spurred because of the Alderman Burke situation. So the mayor and several aldermen introduced proposals. With the mayor's proposals, he's wanting uh, tougher rules for aldermen who want to recuse themselves on votes, Phil, because they might have a conflict of interest. So-called Rule 14, this is what Ed Burke used over and over and over again and didn't really explain what his conflict was. Hundreds of times, right? 400 something times, m many times more than all the other 49 aldermen put together. Um, and then the mayor also introduced an ordinance banning certain outside jobs for aldermen, namely any alderman can't work for any entity that could be a legal party against the city. So that would include being a property tax appeal lawyer, which is what Ed Burke has done for many, many years. But I asked Emmanuel why he stopped well short of a full ban on outside employment, and he brought up the example of Alderman Tom Tunney, who owns Ann Sather's restaurant. Some people will talk about outright ban. I happen to think the changes we just, uh, that I'm proposing reflect that you will have people of diversity, of different backgrounds, of different walks of life, and you want that contribution for a city that's quite diverse and quite robust. Other aldermen like Alderman Michelle Smith and Scott Wagesbeck introduced other ordinances to beef up the power of Inspector General Joe Ferguson and to have an independent financial analyst analyze all the budget decisions. It's something that other cities do that Chicago has fallen short on. And we left messages for Alderman Solis and his staff. We have yet to hear back. Paris, thank you. And be sure to check out our Voter's Guide to the Chicago Election, where you can learn more about aldermanic candidates as well as the candidates for mayor, clerk, and treasurer. That's at WTTW.com slash Voter's Guide. And now to Carol Marine and another take on the Burke investigation. Carol. Phil, thank you. We just heard the reaction from City Council. Now we have two former federal prosecutors to give us their take on this bombshell news that Alderman Solis reportedly was wearing a wire at the behest of federal investigators for the last two years. What does it tell us about the investigation into Alderman Burke and where it may be leading? Joining us, Michael Monaco, a former federal prosecutor here and now a partner at Monaco and Spivak. He is a defense attorney these days. And Gil Sofer, also a former federal prosecutor who is now a managing partner at Catton Muchen Roseman LLP. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. So you've been on both sides of this, the prosecutor, the defense. Mike, just by way of background, when we talk about Ed Burke's phones being listened to, does the judge have to say that's 
you can do that, or can the feds just tap phones and tap offices? What's the difference? Well, wiretaps require a judicial approval. So in secret, the prosecutors go to see a federal judge, normally the chief judge, and ask and present evidence that either a crime was committed or is being committed or will be committed, and therefore we, and, the, and this is the, really the best way to obtain evidence of that crime is to conduct wiretap, secret wiretap, where people do not know they're being recorded. So it's a much bigger deal to do a building, to do your cell phones, to do your offices. But Gil, what if I just want to wire up and record somebody? Does a judge need to say yes to that? No. Uh, so that's called a consensual recording or an undercover recording. That appears to be what has happened with Solis here. And all that requires is the government to put a wire on him and ask him to make a recording or to put a wire on a phone while he's talking to somebody. But Doesn't that's done in secret, judge. too. I mean, you're not advertising it. So why is there this distinction? The difference is with an undercover recording, at least one person to the conversation knows it's being recorded. With a wiretap, no party to the conversation knows it's being recorded. That requires a much higher, stricter standard of review. Kind of a distinction without a radical amount of difference, perhaps. So let's go to the Danny Solis story. The Sun Times reports this morning that Solis was recording Burke. We at NBC just a couple of hour go, hours ago reported that Solis had been recorded himself a year before he reportedly went up on Burke. What does what do those two things tell you, Mike? Well, it sort of makes sense because normally a, a person like Solis would not begin to cooperate unless there was an investigation involving him. And apparently that's what happened, according to what NBC says, that in 2014 he was under investigation. That was probably advised, he was told about that, and then he started using his ability to tape record other people. So is that a deal, Gil? I mean, do, and how does it work? Do the feds knock on your door and say, here's a tape recorder. We'd like you to hear if you recognize your voice on this. Is that how it goes? It can. It can go exactly like that. This is how cases are built. You start with somebody who's a target of an investigation. You get some evidence against them, in this case recordings. You go to him. You know you have bigger fish to fry, and you say, you can help yourself by helping us. And that's always an unpleasant conversation when the when they come with a tape recording of you. That's not that's, a happy moment. That's when the two of you now are wearing your defense hats, right? When your client calls and says, the government's just been at the door. And then, theoretically, you've got to give them somebody bigger. Is that essentially it? Uh, yeah, usually. Yeah, look, that's what the government wants to do. You want to build up. It's much less appealing to build down to someone less significant. So, yes, and in this case, presumably, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing Solis give evidence and get somebody bigger. We don't know what's on those recordings. We'll find out, but that's the way it typically works. These wiretaps and overhears, each of them, both in Burke's premises and it seems with Danny Solis, lasted a long time time. That, that's unusual. And that it, is unusual. Why well, is that of, unusual? Well, no, under the law, a wiretap is only supposed to last 30 days. And then if so, every 30 days, they have to reapply for another uh, warrant, another ability to do that. And occasionally, they require the FBI to prepare a report if the judge wants it. Normally, though, you, every 30 days, the FBI will re we'll return to the courthouse, to the chief judge, in secret, and ask him to continue the, uh, the wiretap. So those, do we deduce from that, and given the length of these things, that enough was being built up and built up that they went forward for a considerable amount of, even the consensual, even the wire, the hidden wire, is a long wiretap. No, it is. And, and look, the wiretap, it, it is long, nine months. And what the government has to prove to the judge is they have to say that 30 days that just passed, we gathered some evidence then. Or here's why we didn't, but here's why we think we still will. That's how it's done. It is unusual to see it nine months running. So it, it's anybody's guess, at least publicly, what's in those uh, materials. And it appears that the complaint that they returned against Alderman Burke was really incidental information that they obtained during that during that wiretap. In other words, yes, yes. that was not what prompted the original wiretap because it began, I think, in, before this event from May of 2017. And so, if we date from 
arguably 2014 when Solis is reportedly under investigation by the feds, then through 2016 to now with Ed Burke. That's about five years, and the statute of limitations is five years, right? From, from the last event. From the last event. Right, right. Okay, so there's a little more on the meter to, right. to run on that. Remember John Christopher of Operation Silver Shovel and the criticism that he was the government's mole, but he was such a bad guy that they couldn't even put him on the witness stand or they'd turn off the jury. And there was the question of whether Christopher was allowed by the feds to operate with abandon for too long as the feds built their case. Is there a reasonable question here about Ed Burke enormously powerful person if he was committing crimes. Danny Solis is a very powerful person. Um, having a significant amount of latitude as the government builds its case? Well, Christopher was a dangerous fellow. Um, I, I, I remember, I, went, I think I went once to El, Pas El Paso to see him before he became a witness. As, Just to visit as, or as, what? As his lawyer. Somebody asked <laughs> me to go see him, so I went to see him. But he was, he turned out to be a very dangerous fellow. And uh, uh, so, I mean, he was doing things that are beyond what we're talking about here with this kind of, where, where Alderman Burke allegedly was trying to get some business for himself. But the city, I mean, the city has an interest and its citizens have an interest in honest government and not deals that are made that benefit lawyers or politicians and don't benefit citizens. Does the government sometimes stay too long on an investigation just because it wants to keep building its case? Oh, look, it can happen, and it happens sometimes. You worry most about it when you're putting guns on the streets or otherwise exposing the public to danger. I don't think that's what we're seeing here. The other thing we don't know is it may be the government didn't have enough to build its case within a year or two years. Only now does it start to have enough. So we, we'll get a, a window into that when the evidence becomes public. That's interesting what Gil just said because Recently, the government asked for an additional 90 days right. here regarding the complaint in order to pre present evidence to the, to the judge on that, case, on that complaint. So that's May. But Ed Burke also originally said in court when he was charged um, that he'd do a preliminary hearing. And I remember sitting there watching his lawyer and watching Ed Burke and thinking, I'm not so sure that Jenner Block and Mr. Sklarski are going to say a preliminary hearing would have been a good idea. Was it a good idea? Well, it's, a, it's a good idea for the defense so they could hear what the evidence is and, and presumably limit the government in terms of what they're going to say in the future. But it's, the government's not going to, I doubt that the government's going to allow for a preliminary hearing here. They, they could have. I know it was the Is defense. Is it a good idea made, for the defense? It's always a good. It's almost always a good idea for the defense, for the reason that Mike just said. You get to hear a little bit of the government's evidence. You get to see some of their witnesses potentially on the stand. That's a wonderful opportunity before trial to get a window into the government's case. So what case. you're talking about is that the publicity would be bad, and, well, that, and that could be. And I'm just curious because I've also heard the argument that the defense might end up opening itself up to things it didn't want to have in open court because it was the defense, as I understand it, who said, yeah, maybe we won't do this preliminary hearing. Well, well that, that may be a publicity issue that they, they don't want to present the evidence publicly at this point. It, it's otherwise a low risk proposition for the defense to go forward with a preliminary hearing. So you both have been around a while. Have you seen something like this in recent years ever? tape recordings of the folks? No, the size, the scope, the power. I mean, a lot of times it's low-hanging fruit, low-level well, aldermen. It's, it's very seldom well, in Chicago. We're in Chicago. <laughs> so, I mean, Blagojevich case, of course, very recently. Prior to that, the Ryan case. So th these cases have been going on for a while here. and It's unfortunate, but they are. They are indeed. Mike Monaco, Gil Sofer, thank you very much for being with us on Chicago tonight. My pleasure, pleasure. More ahead. Stay with us.
Still to come on Chicago Tonight, how today's development with Alderman Burke impacts the race for mayor, that and more in this week's Spotlight Politics. We visit some brave souls surfing the frigid waves of Lake Michigan in Whiting, Indiana. And if surfing's not your cold weather activity of choice, we have some more suggestions for fun wintertime activities in and around Chicago. But first, the city treasurer today announced the second Chicago location of a Hope Inside Financial Empowerment Center. It's aimed at bringing financial literacy directly into underserved communities. At that event, Treasurer Kurt Summers said the centers can help tackle some of Chicago's most persistent problems like violence, poverty, and segregation. Here to tell us about the resources Hope Inside Centers offer is John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope. That's a national nonprofit that's partnered with the Treasurer's Office on the Chicago Uplift 2020 project. And John Hope Bryant, welcome to Chicago Tonight. Honored to be with you. Thanks for having me. Your reputation precedes you. Ah, stop it. <laughs> First of all, what are Hope Inside Centers? What are they? We're the new Starbucks of financial inclusion. We're the private banker to the working poor, the struggling class, and the struggling middle class, folks with too much month at the end of their money. This is the work of Abraham Lincoln, who, by the way, won his convention here in uh, in uh, Chicago in 1860. Um, Abraham Lincoln created a bank in 1865 called the Freedmen's Bank, chartered to teach freed slaves about money after the Civil War. He thought the most important thing he could do after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, was to teach people about the free enterprise system and about self-reliance. Don't let me not just give you a fish, let me give you a fishing pole. Unfortunately, he was killed the next month. And, and but still, that bank would be a hundred billion dollars today, just with the uh, fifty-two million dollars in deposits that were put in by seventy-three thousand former slaves. So let's get back to that Starbucks analogy. Starbucks, you can go there, you can order a bunch of things. Uh, what can you get from one of these centers specifically? Your dignity back. This is, uh, and 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 also you can get some solutions that makes that actually solve. So there's all this these these questions, and you know, Chicago is important to the nation, not just to Chicago, and the crime, the the, the murders, the problems, they seem intractable. People say, oh, it's police brutality. Oh, it's 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 this, it's that. It's a. What if I told you, it's solvable with a number. You can get a credit score when you come and show up at a Hope Inside. You may say that's not all that inspiring. I say not. The average white credit score, the credit score in white Chicago, the white neighborhoods, is 723. The credit score in black Chicago is 589. It's a 150 point spread. So what do these centers do to help narrow that spread? Uh, we help you resolve the reasons that you have a bad credit score, starting with errors. We remove those errors with the credit bureaus off your credit report. This is a 30 point pop. We resolve, we help you negotiate things that are charge-offs and other issues uh, that no one's paying any attention to. That's another 30 or 40 point uh, pop on your credit score. We work with you almost hand-to-hand -hand combat because the banks literally, by law, can't touch that. They can't, the law, the bank must take your application when you walk in the front door, even though they know you're not going to be approved because they're afraid to be sued. We, sitting 10 feet from the banker, can say that credit report looks like a bus accident, <laughs> and we got to do something about it and work with you to get that credit score up. Half so of all have, employers so require a credit score before they'll hire you. So you have a counselor there who will... Uh, a coach, yeah. A coach right. who, will each help, location. who will help a person go through their credit history in such a way to improve their credit rating, which has obviously has a huge impact on your ability to get loans and so forth. Besides a credit score, what other kinds of things can a person uh, get help with? Small business training. Entrepreneurship training, HUD approved home ownership uh, training certification, the earned income tax credit. And if any of your viewers are saying, what's that? And they make $53,000 a year or less, they're approved. If you make $53,000 a year or less and you work in, in Chicago, the governor owes you a check. But $20 billion a year goes back to the federal treasury because we don't ask for the money that's ours. If you are a teacher, you make $40,000 a year, you have two kids, the governor owes you four grand. If you've never filed, it's retroactive for three years. That's $12,000. That's real money. So it's everything from helping you get the EITC, helping you get your credit score up, helping you figure out how to, to get more gainfully employed, helping you to create a job if you can't get one. Uh, I think that a lot of the, these folks who are involved in interesting activities are basically illegal entrepreneurs with hustle skills, import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, talking about drug dealers, security, territory, logistics. Yes, it's a bad profession, 
but there are brilliant young men who could be with a proper role model and a proper grounding put in another direction. But I'm also talking about services for middle class people. Such as? Well, everything I just mentioned to you, half of African Americans have a credit score below 620. Not half of, of poor people. People with suits and ties driving down the street in Lexus automobiles can't get a small business loan. You cannot get a small business loan below 620. Half of all black people in this country uh, are locked out of the free enterprise system. A good portion here in Chicago. Do you know that 25% of blacks in Chicago are unbanked compared to 1.3% of white counterparts? 33% of them own a in home. In other words, they don't have a checking account, there's no savings Nothing. account. Zip. No Zero. relationship with a bank. Right. And if you live in a 500 credit score neighborhood, you have a check casher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store, and a church down the street trying to make you, make, trying to make you feel a little bit better about the pain every week. That's called a therapist. If you, you've never had a riot in a 700 credit score neighborhood in all of Chicago's history. It's never happened because 700 credit score neighborhoods don't riot, they go shopping. That's a stable community with GDP, jobs, economic opportunity, prosperity. Literally, literally, if we can get the credit score up in, in, the, in the challenged neighborhoods in Chicago and the middle class neighborhoods that are on a bubble, get it up 50 points. Everything stabilizes, hope increases. You, you can't police yourself out of this. That activity decreases, more small businesses, more startups, more entrepreneurship, more home ownership. So you now have two centers. How are you getting the word out that these centers offer these services that can help somebody's financial well-being? Well, I came to you. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, I, I've got but a million. But does the average person on the, on the street know, know about this? That of course he or not. She, no? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the challenge. I mean, the, the, the magic of Dr. King, who was here in Chicago as well, is that he made the, the important feel urgent. So we've got to make this topic sexy. We've been making dumb sexy for too long in this country. We've dumbed down and celebrated it. My job is to make this compelling and interesting. So I have a million followers on social media, 70 million video views, which I just did a video in the car talking about the statistics of Chicago. And we're going to share your program here tonight, and we're going to go door to door. Basically, it's a door to door campaign. And once we get some success stories here, which will be easy to do, they'll tell a friend because this is a gift that keeps on giving. John, Hope, Brian, thank you so much for being here. We very much appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Up next, we go behind the scenes of the top political stories in our weekly edition of Spotlight Politics. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. As we've already discussed, the revelations that longtime Alderman Danny Solis wore a wire on Alderman Ed Burke and is reportedly under investigation himself have rocked the city council and its reverberations are being felt in the mayor's race. And so it makes sense that that is the focus of our weekly edition of Spotlight Politics. Here once again to assess the aftershocks and give us a spin on that and the other top stories of the day are members of our political team, Parrish Schutz, and Carol Marine. Colleagues, always good to sit with you. Uh, first of all, Paris, I couldn't help but notice that uh, in, this, in your speaking with some of the city council members, there seemed to be, uh, you referred to it as a code of silence or an omerta kind it, of it a... It did feel like some kind of code of omerta. Words like betrayal, stab them in the back. In my neighborhood, no one, someone would get beaten in the you know what for doing something like this. There's a very tone deaf response from a lot of aldermen as if they don't realize how that looks when they say something like that, like this is some kind of privileged job, and that if there's any information of wrongdoing, well, they're supposed to just keep it between us. Um, it wasn't all aldermen. There were, there were other aldermen that, that you know, were, were rightly concerned about the whole thing, and said it means that there is a greater need for ethics reform. But it, it was some of the entrenched, long-time aldermen, a lot of them that got their positions um, because they inherited them, they were appointed there, that, that had this attitude. Uh, Talk about being part of the problem, mm. though, as opposed to part of the solution. You know, when I listen to those sound bites, I mean, I thought it was outrageous. It's outrageous in 
this day and time, given Chicago's history, that it wasn't so much that they didn't realize what they were saying, they didn't care yeah. what they were saying. I mean, if it weren't for Scott Waggie's back or Michelle Smith that, that pushed back and said, this is, you know, this is not something you protect, it isn't something you keep your mouth shut about, but I think the, the bulk of whom Paris interviewed um, is a reflection on a shameful history. Talk about what you have learned regarding the investigation into the reported investigation, which NBC is reporting, NBC5 is reporting, into Alderman Danny Solis himself. What we reported just about 4 o'clock on our website and 5 o'clock today was that, according to a source familiar with the investigation, a confidential informant wired up on Solis at least a year before Solis wired up on Ed Burke. In other words, since 2014 or thereabouts, Danny Solis has apparently been the target of the feds himself. Do we know uh, for uh, what uh, alleged transgressions? What, what we described in, in our piece was that he was, um, the focus was on his alleged misuse of his official office for his own personal gain and or the personal gain of others with whom he was associated. Paris, uh, there have been reportedly rumors, rumors about Danny Solis wearing a wire. What was the mood in city, uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, the mood in city council today. It was very somber. There were a lot of aldermen and alderwomen that appeared pretty nervous, Phil. Um, it was not business as usual. Ed Burke was sitting off to the side on his own, just kind of a regular grunt like the rest of them. He usually has his podium. He has a little podium that they put on the desk in the middle of city council, and everyone kind of routes through him. They so all go and talk to him. he had a privileged seat. He had a privileged seat. That is, that is gone. And very high-level sources in the city that believe that, that this is just beginning, that this is just this is the tip of the iceberg. And uh, a little, can you expand a little more on that in terms of the potential scope of this investigation? I don't think there's any doubt that there's going to be more charges coming uh, with, with respect to Alderman Burke. Um, there are more public officials, there are more aldermen from, from, from what we hear, uh, that this thing is, is much bigger than what we've seen so far, and what we're seeing is the very beginning of the evidence coming out. I mean, as Carol has said, they've looked into Solis for as long as the last four years, uh, but, but what I've had described to me is this being sort of the beginnings of unveiling what they've been working on for many years. Carol, is this a turning point for the city council? You know, Phil, I don't know. Um, you know, Mike Monaco was here. He's a fine defense attorney. One of, one of his clients right now who's going to go on trial this summer is former 10th Ward Alderman Ed Verdoliak, who is up on his second federal criminal indictment. Um, so and that it, doesn't reflect any great deterrence so uh, on the part is, of uh, his colleagues, is Verdoliak what you're and Burke are, were, are they're old guys now, older guys now. This is something that, I mean, every time we say, oh, the message has been sent by the feds, and you see a prosecutor say, this indictment, you know, we're, we're declaring war on corruption. Well, good luck on that, because that war has been declared and redeclared for as many years as I've been a reporter in before. Paris, how does this impact potentially the mayor's race? It becomes the number one issue in the mayor's race, and if you're seen as an establishment candidate, you can't really escape that cloud. So this is really pummeling Tony Preckwinkle and Susana Mendoza. Preckwinkle, who had reportedly hired Ed Burke Jr., Ed Burke's son, to be in the Department of Homeland Security, and now we learn, or Tribune learns, that he had a history of, of sexual misconduct or sexual harassment statements, and that she had actually talked to Ed Burke about hiring Ed Burke Jr. Susana Mendoza, uh, as we know, very close to Ed Burke in the past, also very close to Danny Solis, coming out of the Hispanic Democratic Organization. She's received tens of thousands of campaign dollars from Danny Solis. She said she will return that money if it's found that he is, is really being investigated for something. So if you're an establishment candidate, corruption now, ethics is the number one issue, ahead of crime and ahead of schools and ahead of uh, pensions because 
be, because of what's happened. And so if, if you're not seen as a reformer, if you can't be taken seriously as a reformer, you're going to have trouble. Uh, Carol, does this benefit any mayoral candidates in particular? It may benefit those who are what we would call down ballot, lesser known. Um, but so many of them have been around before. I mean, not just Mendoza and Preckwinkle, but Gary Chico. Um, who was he's got his teeth he cut his teeth on the finance committee and Ed Burke is a very very good friend but some of the younger lesser known remember this we have what 14 candidates Paris yeah what's the threshold to make it to the top two for a runoff 15%. maybe 15 percent and so nobody knows where this scramble is going to go. And you may have voters who are saying, I hate them all. I hate them all. They're all corrupt. They're all corrupt. And right. aldermen have got to be sweating it too because they know that those same people who don't know who to vote for mayor but know they don't like a lot of them don't like anybody in city council. Only five just unchallenged aldermen or right. six unchallenged aldermen, something like that. Pair of shots. Carol Marine, thank you both. Appreciate it. And back with more right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. The colder weather may send many Midwesterners indoors, but some adventurous souls say surf's up. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia recently spoke with local surfers who wait for nasty weather before hitting the waves. Here is another look. <laughs> Surfing in the winter. You might imagine Hawaii, California, or the Caribbean. But think again. When the weather is just right, surfers ride the waves of Lake Michigan, even in the dead of winter. My name is Mike Killian. I'm a photographer from Chicago. And today we're surfing the south end of Lake Michigan. We're in northwest Indiana. Killian and his friend Ian Jacobson are getting ready to hit the waves at Whiting Lakefront Park. How do you stay warm out there? Like, let me tell you, when you're diving under icy waves and they're coming from every direction, you don't really have an opportunity to, to be cold. You know, you, you got your adrenaline going and you're in the moment, and yeah, that definitely adds to the fun. Beyond adrenaline, surfers are covered head to toe in quarter-inch thick wetsuits, exposing only their faces. After applying a layer of wax to help stick to his 10-foot longboard, Killian hits the waves. He says his longer surfboard helps him connect with waves before they break. I like to ride more of a classic style. A lot of people used to ride this style board in like the 60s. Um, and so it's just a little bit more simple. While Killian paddled from the shore, Chicagoan Rex Flodstrom set off from the rocks with his shortboard. The shortboard is more high performance, sharper turns and maneuvers. Yeah, the waves are pretty good today. It's kind of windy. It's, uh, I mean, uh, we're always hoping it's going to improve, but since there's waves, you might as well try to catch, catch them. Unlike ocean waves, driven by the gravitational pull of the moon and sun, Lake Michigan's waves are caused by the wind. That's why waves as high as 15 feet or more can reach the south end of Lake Michigan when a strong north wind travels the 300-mile length of the lake. The waves are a lot different than uh, the waves on the o ocean, as you can tell, but uh, it's still just like the same effect, getting the feeling of riding a wave. It's like unlike anything else, so a lot of guys like to do it just because of that feeling. At times, the choppy, uneven Lake Michigan surf acts like a washing machine. Josiah Griffin is a regular from nearby Highland, Indiana. They're pretty big, to be honest. So for us, we're trying to get ahead of the wave before it breaks, otherwise we're just gonna get smashed. But we're just trying to stay alive, honestly. You know, this is a gnarly day out there. It's, uh, it's, not cons it's not clean. To prepare for optimal conditions, surfers often use forecasting tools, like this one measuring wave height. Some of the biggest waves that day topped seven feet. Jacobson stands out among the bunch, literally. He's using a paddle surfboard, which can be a tricky ride. Fighting the wind, you're like a sail up there when you're on top of that board. The surfers are lower, so they're more resistant to the wind. You know, it's not going to affect them. And when there's a dozen or so surfers in the water, he's extra careful. Surfers don't like the paddleboard out there. They see a bigger craft and assume, you know, you're going to get in your way. So, you know, that's one of the things that's always in the back of my mind, just making sure you're out of everyone's way. You just want to make sure in any form of surfing that etiquette's key. The backdrop of industry on the lake is notable. 
Surfers have taken legal action against nearby U.S. steel for toxic spills, and pollution is apparent. I'm used to it now. I've been surfing here and photographing the scene for 15 years. So, um, you know, it's sad when you come over the beach and you see all the plastic and trash and everything that's get pushed in here, and there's really nowhere for it to go because all the industry is taking up the shoreline. But as most surfers on the lake told me, they'll take what they can get. And as the temperatures drop, so does the number of surfers. Days like today and as we get further into winter are days where you're like happy to see somebody because there's going to be less and less people. It's just a good way to get outside and have a good day when it's, what, like 30 degrees. <laughs> For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. Last month, a U.S. magistrate judge allowed the nonprofit Surfrider Foundation to intervene in a federal lawsuit against U.S. Steel filed for violations of the Clean Water Act in Lake Michigan. That legal action is ongoing. Well, as if you didn't know, Chicago winters can be fierce, ice, icy, snowy, windy, and above all, cold. So it makes sense that many people would rather curl up on the couch with a book or binge Netflix than venture outside. But why should summer? Get all the love. There's a whole wonderland of winter adventure to be had out there, both indoors and out. And here to help convince us to bundle up and get out there are Peggy Stewart. She's Assistant Director of Culture, Arts and Nature at the Chicago Park District. And Jason Lesnevich. He's Director of Cultural Tourism for Choose Chicago. And welcome both to you. Okay. This on a night when things are, when the temperatures are about to really drop. Okay, Peggy, one of your most popular outdoor winter activities is coming up this weekend. Tell us what that is. So we've got Polar Adventure Days. Uh, many folks in Chicago have been out to Northern Island, and I would welcome you to come back, right? There's 92 acres. There's always something to see. The event is free from 12 to 4. Free hot cocoa for those of those folks that get there early. But the most important thing is that you bundle up, that you get ready to, you know, trek the island, uh, see if you can check out the snowy island owl that's along the lakefront. Uh, we'll have uh, Siberian Huskies, we'll have indoor and outdoor activities, and it's for folks of all ages. I think it's fun to look for tracks in the winter, and Northern Island is a great spot to go. Uh, Jason, a couple of big weeks are coming up in Chicago. Uh, tell us about them. Yeah, starting this Friday is uh, Chicago Restaurant Week. It's a, a celebration of our culinary scene, which is the best in the country. And there's prefix menus for lunch, brunch, and dinner at about 400 restaurants across the city. It goes from January 25th all the way up to February 7th. And in terms of the cost, what, uh, what are you talking about? So prefix um, lunch is $24, brunch is the same, uh, and dinner will run you 36 or 48 depending on the restaurant. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's not inexpensive, but it's, uh, is it a better rate than one might when ordinarily talking get? about some of those, you know, high-end restaurants that are going to put out great menus, talking about some of those West Loop restaurants like Blackbird, um, you know, that, uh, or even Sepia that, you know, really offer a great value during Restaurant Week, absolutely. And Theater Week, tell us about Theater, theater Week. Week's an amazing celebration of our theater scene from February 7th through the 17th. There are about 115 productions at either $30, $15, or sometimes even less so it's a great time to go indoors and uh, celebrate our theater scene which is one of the best in the country as well and again these are reduced prices for they the are week. yes these are celebratory weeks to really get you um, out into our theaters into our restaurants at, at special prices okay we've uh, segued briefly into indoor spaces yes. Peggy uh, what indoor spaces does the park district have coming up the well people this, can... this this Friday we've got the International Puppet Festival at Marquette Park which is a wonderful thing for folks to, to be be a part of and that's a free event. Uh, next weekend we're really excited on February 2nd to be doing the second annual Lantern Festival for the Chinese New Year. It's a great partnership with Choose Chicago for with the Art Institute where people can do activities in the Art Institute and then we do a lantern procession through Millennium Park into Maggie Daly with lion dancers and with skaters in uh, Chinese costumes. It's absolutely a beautiful evening with the city in the in the background. It's a beautiful night. What kind of turnout have you had at some of these events that you're Well, we about? did it for the first time last year and we were surprised. We had almost a thousand people come out because it is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Uh, we didn't think about the fact that people would stop along the BP Bridge and take photographs the whole time, but it is just awe-inspiring. So really, I would say bundle up. It is Chicago. 
and so you need to get out in order to appreciate the indoors, right? <laughs> and uh, aside from uh, aside from restaurants and theaters, uh, Jason, what are some other indoor activities that uh, people can take advantage of right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm going to stay on Chinese New Year, and we bring over two troops from China to perform as the signature signature event for Chinese New Year at the Symphony Center on February 10th. The China National Peking Opera will be here, and the Hubei's Bells um, Orchestra, which perform on replicas of the ancient imperial bells of China. In fact, I think we saw pictures of them earlier. Uh, and in terms of the spectacle, in terms of the theatricality, what can people expect at that event? You know, uh, Peking Opera is all about the vocal artistry, the musicians, um, and um, the acting and the acrobats. It's, it's kind of a combination of acrobats, singing, and music. Um, and the Hubei Chimes Bell Orchestra is um, an amazing Chinese traditional instruments combined with these bells, these massive bronze bells that they kind of hit with poles. It's really a fascinating concert. Okay, Peg, you say somebody is uh, interested in outdoor sports but doesn't want to do surfing necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> what are the kinds of uh, sporting activities does the Park District offer that well, people can, can take advantage sure, of? Sure, you can go to Northerly Island and do some snowshoeing if you'd like. You can do so, you can learn from the Blackhawks uh, to, to play hockey, which is a wonderful thing in our ice rinks. And then for those folks that do want to stay in, you can obviously focus on swimming in the wintertime. There's lots of ways to get involved in the parks. I think it's a, it's a perfect place inside and outside. Your local field house, if you walk into your local field house, they're happy to tell you all about what they have to offer. Jason, one uh, winter sport that's becoming increasingly popular in Chicago is curling. curling. Uh, tell us about curling and where somebody can yeah, curl there's, up. There's a couple places. Uh, Kaiser Tiger, it's uh, this uh, bar in the West Loop, craft beer kind of emporium bar, and they have outdoor um, curling rinks that you can go and try some Bring curling. Your room. Also <laughs> over at yes, also over at Gallagher Way, they do some curling activities, which is the park just outside of Wrigley. Um, definitely one of the great spots to do some curling. Do either of you have a favorite uh, wintertime activity uh, that uh, you can share? Definitely cross country skiing. Yeah, yeah, I love to cross country skiing. Where do you ski. do that? I do it sometimes at Northerly Island if we have enough snow, and now we do, and we're supposed to get more, so that's good. You know. And uh, Jason, how about you? I go sledding with my son. Uh, you can't go wrong Where with sledding. Go? I go to Warren Park. It's this park right on Western and Devon, basically. Nice sledding hill. You can go to Montrose or over to Soldier Field as well. Great sledding there. Yeah, we're seeing some people have a good time right, uh, <laughs> right there. Watch out for that inner tube, kids. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Peggy and Jason, thank you both for being here. Very much appreciate it. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. And if we've talked you into putting on your mittens and having a wintry good time, you'll find more on all those activities on our website. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And please join us tomorrow night live at Severing. At 7, that is. Everything has a price, including government shutdowns. Local economists talk about that and assess the overall state of the economy. And we meet the new host of WBEZ's Morning Shift, Jen White. Now, for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.